Welcome to Lawton Online with your host, Andrew Lawton. He's locked, loaded, and ready to fire. Lawton Online starts right now. Hello, Canada. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It is great to have you joining me on the program today. My name is Andrew Lawton, and this is Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. And this is a phenomenally fantastic show. I mean, I think it always is. And I'm not biased in the least, I assure you. But we're going to, in a few moments, be talking about bullying. And not in the feel-good, you know, Bell Let's Talk way, but, but talking about why we don't empower kids to stand up for themselves as much as we need to. Also going to talk later on about one school board in the U.S. that has decided to declare war on fun because, well, one popular schoolyard activity is just too emotionally and physically harmful. And I assure you, it'll make you want to homeschool your kids. But I wanted to begin the show, and I'll play in a couple of moments' time, an excerpt of my interview with Prime Minister Stephen Harper from this week. Now, many of you may know I also host throughout the week on AM 980 in London, Ontario, a daily afternoon talk show. And it's great, you know, so if you're ever tired of listening to one hour of me a week, uh, well, you could also listen to two hours a day of me <laughs> every week uh, for uh, the rest of, well, as long as I'm there. But I had the chance on Wednesday of this week to speak to the Prime Minister. Now, this is quite an honor for, for me being in media because, I, I mean, whenever you're interviewing the leader of a country, re- regardless of whether or not you are inclined to agree with their vision for the country, it's an honor and a phenomenal one at that. I had in February the opportunity to interview the prime minister uh, about C-51, namely, but also in, in this uh, particular interview, given that it's an election time, we get to really talk about some of the election issues or things that are surfacing as election issues. And we spoke about jobs, we spoke about the economy, but I, I found the most interesting and compelling part of the interview was the section on Bill C-24. Now, C-24 was the bill put forward by Member of Parliament Devinder Shori, a very, very uh, nice man. I've met him on a number of occasions, and he is himself an immigrant. So understands and I think values what acquired Canadian citizenship can mean for you. He put forward this bill, C-24, which was an amendment to the Citizenship Act. But what this bill did more notably was empower the government to strip citizenship from convicted terrorists and traitors. Not suspected, not alleged, not accused, but convicted men and women who have been uh, convicted under those categories of legislation. Now, I've been uneasy about this bill from the start. While I agree emotionally that we need to be tough on terror, my objection to the bill is that I don't think it really is that tough on terror. I would much rather us take a harder line in terms of whether or not we award citizenship to people that could be down the road terrorists or or otherwise criminals anyway. And I get that we can't always do that. And in many cases, we can't. But I think that should be the goal rather than retroactively changing our minds after the fact and saying, "Ah, no, 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 we're, we're taking away your citizenship. So for background, the bill requires someone to have citizenship with another country. So you can't make someone stateless. You can't uh, basically write the script to another Tom Hanks movie. I think The Terminal was the one. Tom Hanks uh, cannot go back to Krakosia because they, uh, they, they have their own version of C-24 there. And more importantly, and I think this is the most interesting part, if you are going to deport someone, which can only happen after their sentence has been served, then obviously that country has to take them back, has to be willing to take them back. So that's been one of my questions as well, which is away from the fundamentals of this, can this practically be enforced? So when I had the opportunity to speak with the prime minister and and ask him any questions I wanted, there was no vetting or or scripting of the questions. These were some of the issues I wanted to cover. So I'm going to play for you now an excerpt from my interview with Stephen Harper. If you'd like to hear the full interview, you can do that at am980.ca. But this is the section that has to do with Bill C-24, both questions and both answers. 
I wanted to talk about one of the big issues of the campaign here, which is obviously the really the enactment and now the application of Bill C-24, the uh, quite proud revocation by your government of the citizenship of uh, Toronto 18 would-be bomber, Zachariah Amara. Now, the Liberals and NDP have said that this has created a, a, a tiering of citizenship in Canada. One question that I have about this is whether or not the Canadian government can even force Jordan or any other country in the future uh, to take someone under these provisions back. And, and if not, does that not make this bill a bit more symbolic than anything else? Well, look, that will obviously uh, become an issue that uh, we'll have to deal with when uh, when this individual is, is ultimately released from prison. Um, but clearly it gives uh, the government the tool to argue that uh, he should be in his country of citizenship rather than Canada. Look, Andrew, I think to most Canadians, um, you know, Canadians of all backgrounds, this is just self-evident. I, I find it. It is just inexplicable, the position of the Liberals and NDP. I've, I've called it political correctness on steroids. Uh, there's, there are very few people in this country who think that if uh, you are guilty of uh, trying to kill uh, thousands of Canadian citizens and you want to destroy this country, that you would somehow re- retain your citizenship when there is no legal reason uh, that the government needs to do that. It, it's incomprehensible. As you know, the bill was actually put forward by... Devinder Shorey, who uh, is one of our members of Parliament, himself an immigrant. Um, of course, there are there are tiers, and one tier is that uh, the ordinary uh, the ordinary uh, uh, immigrant uh, does not in any way identify with the kind of person who's actually out to destroy this country. When we look at this bill, which is applied to uh, specifically terrorists to traitors. Would there be other types of crimes in the future that you would consider expanding this to, like, for example, a serial killer or a, a rapist or, or someone who did something to, to children who fell into this category and, and had a, a second citizenship with another country? Well, you know, obviously we can we can look at options in the future. The, the expansion of but, – but the reason we did this expansion, the expansion of this to terrorists and treason offenses really is consistent with the way the laws all, always worked um, you know, we've been able to revoke citizenship, for example, for war criminals. So it's really been in cases where the person's criminal acts are not just vile, but they actually demonstrate that the person uh, has no uh, loyalty of any kind to the country or its values. And uh, I think this is what is so inexplicable about the other uh, parties' positions, to suggest that, um, you know, somehow it's demeans Canadian citizenship by taking away citizenship from these people. I think most Canadians, whether they're, um, you know, whether they're immigrants or, uh, or, or other Canadians, understand that uh, what demeans Canadian citizenship would be to allow war criminals and convicted terrorists and people who are actually out to destroy and defame our country to keep their citizenship. It's just they have a position that, frankly, is indefensible to virtually all Canadians. And I'm inclined to agree. I think most Canadians do see terrorism because, let's face it, it is an affront not just against the criminal code of Canada, but an affront against our identity as Canadians. When a terrorist attacks Canada, driven by ideology of any kind, it is something that is an attack and strikes a chord and basically is a knife in the heart to any Canadian who is proud of being a Canadian. So when we look at that, yes, there is obviously and understandably an emotional response to terrorism, and there should be. This shouldn't be something that we just see as being like any other crime. This is a hugely, hugely important one. And in this day and age, it's a pertinent one for governments to deal with. But herein lies the problem. One of the problems anyway is that When you say that you are going to strip the citizenship of someone who's behind bars, it is symbolic. You're not really doing anything but that. In a lot of cases, these people will never see the light of day. Even though Zachariah Amara, the one of the Toronto 18 uh, bombers or would-be bombers, even though he is behind bars, he's eligible for parole next year, he is unlikely to see the light of day. And if we do, then we have a bigger problem with the justice system that we need to deal with.
then again, I wouldn't put it past anyone or anything. But when we are dealing with something like this, I fear that this is a move that is more of a symbolic redefinition of citizenship than it is a bold and defiant stand against terrorism. You know, I don't think any Canadians deny that there is a genuine threat against terrorists or of terrorists against Canadians. I don't think any sensible Canadians deny that. I, I should be clear. I think the NDP does deny it. And apparently so do the Liberals, because basically Justin Trudeau has just become not even NDP light. He's basically made the Liberal Party of Canada NDP heavy, especially on the terror issue. You know, I had a chuckle during the Monk debate when Justin Trudeau said uh, that, you know, Stephen Harper thinks there are terrorists hiding in every this and that. And he probably thinks there are terrorists behind the podium. Now, I heard from two people who were actually at the Monk debate that the laugh you heard in the audience was not actually Justin Trudeau's joke. But the joke combined with the fact that at that moment, Stephen Harper looked behind his podium and, and smirked. Now, I didn't see this myself. I wish I did. But I've been told by two people that that was actually part of why the audience was laughing there. So, so no, I, I don't think there's ever been an overstatement of the frequency of terrorism and terrorist attacks by the Prime Minister. I don't think there's ever been an overstatement of the risk of terrorism. I think in a lot of cases, Stephen Harper does believe that it is an imminent threat to freedom in general, the global jihadist threat. He's spoken about this in unequivocal terms. And here's where I think for any conservatives that are getting all pissed off that I have uh, raised objection to C24, I should say that I, I disagree with why Trudeau and Mulcair oppose C24. My disagreement, my objection is not because I necessarily am bothered by the two tiers of citizenship. I recognize that for war criminals, we already have that in place. I think it concerns me, but my problem is not from this Care Bear place of having a theme song playing. Well, I talk about why I'm proud to be Canadian, which, by the way, invariably I am. No, I see the slippery slope argument as being more than just a trope in this case. I see it as being a very genuine issue that this could be opening up a can of worms that we do not have the mechanisms to deal with. We can't force Jordan to take Zachariah Amara back. And one item, I, I have not raised this in the interview, but I mentioned it on my show when I was chatting about this after the interview, Australia as an example, has a very similar bill in effect to C-24, a law that allows the government to strip dual citizens of their Australian citizenship if convicted of terrorism. Let's suppose, for an example, that Omar Cotter... No, no, no. I, I don't want to uh, make any claim against him that people could assume being uh, a fact. No. Let's say that Ahmed Cotter, fake name, were to go to Australia acquire Australian citizenship along with his Canadian citizenship. And let's say that he commits a terrorist act or is stopped from committing a terrorist attack, goes through the courts, admits to it, confesses, is convicted of whatever the specific terrorism law was. Australia says he's a dual citizen with Canada. We've got to deport him. Why is it now our, now our problem as Canadians to deal with him? Would we even want to or would we block that? I'm frankly not convinced that we did enough to block Omar Cotter from coming back on Canadian soil despite his citizenship. It was a U.S. problem. He was in Guantanamo Bay. I would have been just as happy. In fact, I would have been even more happy if he were still in Guantanamo Bay. But no, because he was a Canadian citizen, he became our problem. Now, we can't strip Cotter of his citizenship. He was born in Toronto, is a natural-born Canadian citizen, and does not have citizenship anywhere else. But why should we treat terrorists differently? Why should we, should we have two tiers of terrorists, then? The terrorists who get to stay here because they already got rid of their other citizenship or never had it in the first place, versus those who do still have citizenship to another country. And then we also have to deal with the more pragmatic problem here, which is that there are a lot of countries that, let's face it, will not look too poorly upon terrorists, certainly not by our standards. 
yes, we're not releasing or deporting people until they have served out their sentence. But do we really think that Pakistan, Iran, etc., do we really think that these are countries where we would want to send people that were convicted of plotting or executing a terrorist attack against Canada? Do we really want to send them back to those countries? which have absolutely dismal track records on dealing with terrorists within their own borders. I mean, look at how long Osama bin Laden was living in Pakistan virtually unabated. When push comes to shove, I want us to be unequivocally against terrorism. I want Canadians to not just oppose terrorism, which I think everyone does, but to recognize that it is, in fact, a threat. And it takes many forms. It's not just Muslim terrorism. It's not just ISIS. There are other forms of terrorism. But the imminent one that we face in 2015 is terrorism inspired by Islamic radicals. We need to recognize that that is, in fact, a threat. And I don't think anyone is deterred by losing their citizenship or by the threat of losing their citizenship. I don't think it's a deterrent. I think that by the time it's put into place, it is purely symbolic. Now, I'm not against government making decisions that have more of a symbolic effect than a legitimate effect, but own that's what you're doing. Zachariah Amara is not a sympathetic character. If the government is going to apply the provisions of C-24 to strip someone of their citizenship, he is the perfect candidate for that. Because he would have been involved in what would have been, or was involved, I guess, in what would have been the worst terrorist attack in Canadian history. We don't know what the casualty count would have been, and thank God it never actually happened. But there were plans to blow up the Parliament of Canada, the Peace Tower the Prime Minister's office, the headquarters of CSIS, RCMP headquarters, other political assassinations. This was going to be something potentially on the scale of 9-11, perhaps even greater. There were a lot of people involved. This was not just one guy with a long gun like the Michael Zehoff Bebo case, which still terrible. But the one thing I wanted to bring up in that interview with Stephen Harper from a few moments ago is this question of why not other criminals as well. Paul Bernardo, not a terrorist by our understanding or definition of the word terrorist, but had three lives lost because of him. If he were a dual citizen of Canada and another country, would we really miss him if he weren't here? Anyone who does something to children, other rapists, Serial murders. People like Luca Magnata, if he were a citizen of another country, would we not want to get rid of him? So where do we draw the line? Citizenship does not mean that you are perfect all of a sudden. Quite the contrary. I think we have a number of imperfect Canadians. I think most of them work in the Parliament of Canada anyway. But we have a number of imperfect Canadians that still are allowed to take Canadian citizenship despite having criminal records or keep Canadian citizenship despite having criminal records. So where do we draw the line? Is terrorism really in that much different a category because of the emotion or ideology behind it than murder, rape, other absolutely heinous crimes. But you're dealing with such a small subset of the population that this would even apply to. Not just terrorists, but convicted terrorists who have dual citizenship with another country. That is a reasonably small group. And if I were someone plotting a terrorist attack, I would make darn sure before I did it to revoke my other country's citizenship just in case I got caught. But I don't even think we're really seeing something here where there's that much forethought into how many people this will apply to. When you have the one that it does, like Zachariah Amara, go for it. And that was a nine-year-old case, by the way. That was a nine-year-old case, but the law 
thankfully was retroactive. And I say thankfully because regardless, I think if you're going to put in a law, you need to make sure and make darn sure that it's going to apply, especially if there is such a, a narrow description of what it or who it could actually apply to. We've got to take a quick break here. Look, I, I'm nothing if not open to wanting to hear differing opinions on this, and I realize that this is, is going to be something that's going to get a lot of objection or, or backlash from different conservatives. And I, I'm not saying this is an indictment against Stephen Harper. I understand why the law exists. I just don't particularly agree with it. Andrew at andrewlawton.ca is my email address. More of Lawton Online on the rebel.media. When we come back, you're listening to the fearless source of commentary that is The Rebel. I'll be right back, Canada. Stay tuned. He's irreverent, intelligent, and indefatigable. You're tuned in to Lawton Online with Andrew Lawton. Hello and welcome back to Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. So this next segment is a bit of an interesting one, and it actually, and I'll give you a little bit of a confession in advance, it's a little bit of a personal one as well. Now, I'm, I'm not going to get, well, I shouldn't make that promise. I'm going to try to not get too saccharine and <laughs> too mushy on you here, but there is a personal connection to this issue for me because it has to do with bullying. And you know what? Bullying is something that, most people have endured in some form. I think the problem is that a lot of people have or, or had parents who, who saw it as, oh, just character building. You know, just, just suck it up and, and deal with it. And then you have other parents on the opposite side of the spectrum who basically think that it's the end of the world and you need to change schools and, and move towns and, and then leave the country just because someone says they don't like your hairdo. So so we need to recognize that, yes, bullying is serious. But that doesn't mean that you have to overreact to every single thing. I was bullied. From the time I was about eight years old until, well, you know, hopefully sometime in the near future, I have been the, the victim of bullying. In a lot of cases, it's been about, you know, weight because, well, let's face it, I'm fat. And in other cases, it's been something that has just been because they wanted to make fun of me and they're, they're going to find something. So I, I have a soft spot for victims of bullying because you know what I, I i was one and i am one now with that being said i also recognize that schools have gotten even worse at dealing with the problems now because back when i was in school they, they didn't really deal with it they you know would say they would and, and ultimately that was sort of it you were left to fend for yourself and and you know what it didn't really work but at the same time, I also didn't do enough when I was dealing with it to address situations. I didn't. I had parents who were supportive of me and, and were there for me, but never really told me the one thing I needed to learn, which was sometimes violence is the answer. You know, having the the loving, you know, kind parents that I that I had who frankly knew that I would probably lose any fight I got into, they were telling me quite the opposite. Violence is never the answer. This was sort of the, the message on, on which people for for decades have grown up. Violence is not the answer. It's only been in adulthood that I've really come to realize that when you're dealing with the schoolyard, sometimes it is. And I don't like that it is. I don't like that that's the way things are, but I can't help but recognize that indeed they are. Now, the catalyst for this particular discussion is a story out of Southern California where a school age man or young man, young boy, 17 years old, I think he's in that uh, in-between stage, a, a teenager anyway, was punished because he intervened when a classmate was being bullied. He intervened when a fellow student was being bullied and used violence to do it. And he received punishment, despite police even saying he had done nothing wrong. Now, I want to make something very clear here. The word bullying gets, I think, thrown around a lot. And in many cases, it's done indiscriminately. People are told that bullying is wrong. And most people agree that bullying is wrong. But we don't really recognize that in some cases, it's not bullying. It's assault. It's a criminal matter. It's violence. And you know what? I'm not talking about a shove on the schoolyard, but if someone is getting beaten, if someone is actually getting pummeled, it seems to me that that goes a little bit beyond regular run-of-the-mill bullying, and I'm not sure where the line should be. 
I don't think if someone pokes you in the forehead that that's assault, that that's a police matter in a lot of cases when you're dealing with the, the fact that, let's face it, kids are, are needing to get rid of aggression that they're certainly not uh, getting rid of in gym class. We'll be talking about that later on as well. But the, the, this is a roundabout way of, of saying that when something is happening that is violent, we're not, not just talking about teasing here. We're not just talking about light taunting. We are talking about something that is, in fact, and can be very serious. Now, in the case of Cody Pine, the student in question at Huntington Beach High School, he last week was caught taking down a bully with one punch. He walks into where the bullying is occurring, and I'll share a little bit about what was going on in just a moment, and with one punch, the bully falls to the ground, and you can see at the tail end of the uh, viral cell phone quality video that's circulating is bleeding. Well, it happens. Not a lot, but enough. Now, this is significant in a few ways, because you know what? You can understand how... A punch could do a lot of damage. But then we look at what was actually happening in advance of that. The person who was punched, the initial bully of the situation, was pummeling a boy at the school who is partially blind. He's blind in one eye, as I understand it. I I don't think that makes a huge difference, but I think it does uh, certainly play into effect and is relevant in some way. And he's being pummeled. Cody Pine goes on, gets with that one punch. You, you can't uh, can't deny he's got a good right hook. Gets the bully to the ground, asks Austin, who is the blind boy, if he was okay, and then starts swearing and yelling at the aggressor, who has uh, been identified in uh, media reports, not by name, but in the case of the Daily Mail piece, as the queried and dazed aggressor. And... I think when we look at what actually happened in this video, we don't know the backstory. Some people have said, well, maybe the blind kid was actually the aggressor. And maybe, you know what, the camera only picked up a certain part of it. Yeah, that's fine. But the fact is, because of the nature of what happened, police were called. Police did, in fact, intervene. And police interviewed all the parties involved. And well, they decided they were not going to... Uh, push things too, too far. They did, in fact, arrest the person who in the video appears to be the bully here, the one who was knocked to the ground at the end. They did release him. But ultimately, they did not say that anyone else was in trouble, nor did they say anyone else should be in trouble. They said the victim and suspect knew each other, had a history of not getting along. The victim got into an argument with the suspect, and then the suspect punched the victim several times. So they say it was the byproduct of an argument, not a, a, a physical altercation initiated by anyone else. The third student who intervened, they say, did the right thing. He did so to prevent any future harm. So I don't think that anyone here, apart from the suspect, if we use the police speak, did anything wrong. Police said they don't anticipate arresting anyone else. And here's the great part. One officer responsible for the case, Jennifer Marlatt, said, quote, the uh, the student who stepped in, his actions were reasonable, unquote. Well, then we go to the high school where it doesn't matter if it's reasonable or not. It doesn't matter what the police have said. The high school will make its own decisions, decide its own outcomes for these types of cases. Cody Pine, the 17-year-old who's being heralded around the Internet and offline as well as a hero for intervening for a disabled student uh, classmate of his. He absolutely is a hero. He absolutely is a hero, and I think more people need to recognize that. I wish when I was dealing with bullies, and granted, it sometimes got physical, but it was never to the extent that I was being pummeled. I I never felt physically endangered or or even in a, a prolonged sense physically threatened, but I wish anyone had intervened. Now, you can say that I was a wimp for not sticking up for myself, and and hey, no argument for me, I was. 
And that's one of my big regrets about it is that I did not do more to protect myself. But the world is run in a lot of cases by those who show up. And you know what? It takes someone to become a an active bystander instead of a passive bystander, like so many of us, to really help people who need it the most. So I wanted to go back to the school's response here. Not only were there several reports that Cody Pine had been kicked off the football team, but he was, in fact, punished by the school, reprimanded by the school. And I find this to be laughable. There was a quote given by a school official saying that basically zero tolerance was the name of the game. The school district said it in the education code. It's a school district's responsibility to protect student records. Okay, so they said they're not going to comment too publicly. She said that no one is allowed to use violence. This is basically what they've done to draw their line in the sand. Quote, the school is now responding to this isolated incident by interviewing students and witnesses to determine exactly what happened. Additionally, the school is working with local authorities to define the appropriate actions necessary once all of the information is collected. And here is the kicker. Huntington Beach High School has a very strong anti-bullying code of conduct and will not condone this type of behavior from any student. So zero tolerance seems to do more to knock the people who are protecting the bullies than it does to protect the actual... Sorry, it does more to protect the bullies than the people who are actually protecting the bullies. And that, to me, is a huge point of concern. It doesn't matter now because they've blurred the lines and made all forms of physical violence, even self-defense, even defense of another, illicit acts. And I find that to be absolutely shameful. I do. I find it to be a brutal and so saddening in a way, miscarriage of, not justice, I don't want to be overly dramatic, but but justice by school board anyway. Because I think it's indicative of a broader cultural problem we see here, which is that society loves victims, we know that. But we would rather see people continue to be victimized. We'd rather see people and elevate them as victims then actually recognize and respect someone doing a good thing. You remember that famous Edmund Burke quote, and I know I'm paraphrasing it here, but, and I love this one, absolutely love this quote. All that is required for evil to prevail or to prosper is for good men to do nothing. So why is it now that good men doing something, or women, don't want to be sexist, but good people doing something is somehow problematic just because a little bit of blood was drawn? You know what? When I look back at my own experiences, my own memories, the reason I said at the top of this segment and the reason I maintain that I wish I had embraced violence is because nothing else works. Nothing else works. There's something to be said about needing to fight fire with fire, and and that was the case of Cody Pine. He was dealing with an imminent situation of violence, and you know what? No whistle, no zero-tolerance campaign, no phone call to a teacher is going to do anything when in that very moment someone's head is getting bashed in. But even more broadly, if you're dealing with the chronic systemic issues of bullying for people, Violence is the only thing that proves that you are not a pushover. You see, you get made fun of even more if you tell on the person. You get made fun of even more if you ignore it. You get made fun of even more if you walk away. 
proving that you are not going to give in. That's the only tool that you have in your arsenal. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, the four foot tall scrawny kid should try to punch the nose out of the 300 pound, you know, six foot tall grade nine student. And I'm sure they are. There are some of those. No, because you know what? You need to be well trained for it, but you need to prove that you're not going to be a pushover. And it's concerning. It is. Because I don't like the idea of kids being in a brawl. But I recognize what I think most other people need to recognize as well, which is that kids need to stand up for themselves. And thank goodness there are other kids that are prepared to step up for those who can, because I never had that. And thank goodness that young Austin did, because you know what? He needed it. And good for Cody, even though the school has been uh, rather equivocal in its defense or, well, not really defense at all of him. Thank goodness his family is grateful. Most of the world is on his side. And it reminds me a lot of the case of Casey Hines from a few years ago. This is the Australian student, the gentle giant he was, who flipped his bully upside down and dropped him to the ground and was also heralded by the world as a hero, even if the school board didn't really recognize it. We've got to take a quick break here. When we come back, more Lawton Online on the rebel.media. My name is Andrew Lawton. We'll be right back, Canada, in just a couple of moments. Stay tuned. You're listening to Lawton Online with your host, Andrew Lawton, exclusively on the rebel.media. Email your thoughts to Andrew at andrewlawton.ca or tweet Andrew using at Andrew Lawton. And we are back here on Lawton Online on the rebel.media. So I'm keeping somewhat of an education theme going this episode. I mean, arguably every episode is an education theme because you know what? People learn something when they listen in. But specifically in this uh, this particular edition, because I was speaking a few moments ago about schoolyard bullying and, and trying to take the broader look at that, which is that, yes, bullying is real, but also the first line of defense and the best defense for any victim of bullying is going to come from the student themselves or a concerned bystander, not a bully-free zone, not a colored ribbon campaign, and not whatever other cockamamie idea people are floating. But then we also have to look at the other side, which is school administrators just making plain bad decisions. And I can think of no more pertinent example, and probably the best example so far of the school year, than with the Mercer Island School District, which, I kid you not, banned the game TAG. Yes, tag, you know, running around the schoolyard and tapping someone and saying you're it, then running away from them as fast as possible. That's no longer allowed. Well, it is again because of public backlash, but the school is looking up alternative suggestions to the game and and to its policies. Let me share a little bit of the background here. Now, Mercer Island is a very enclosed community, I understand, near Seattle. Now, I've been to Seattle, but I've never been to Mercer Island. And the Mercer Island School District made this decision, which prompted a lot of backlash from parents. They started a Facebook group and they wanted uh, people aware of how ridiculous this was. The parents had their concerns elevated on social media so much so that media in Seattle learned about this. Specifically one Jason Rance, a talk show host with KIRO. FM. Now, he decided to see this through. And he said quite candidly that he disagreed with this. He's a talk show host. I get that. We speak the same language. He spoke to the communications director for the school district about the concerns, and she said that, quote, the rationale behind this is to ensure the physical and emotional safety of all students. Yeah, because I've never felt so emotionally unsafe as when someone, you know, taps me on the back and says, you're it. But she says there's a physical safety component. She says kids need to, quote, keep their hands to themselves, unquote, as Jason Rance writes. After all, a pat on the back in a voluntary game of tag might make you mildly uncomfortable. 
He says what I think most sensible people agree with. We're not dealing with sensible people here, I realize. He says the van, the ban doesn't make sense, especially when you consider other uh, sports and games that the school does allow. And I'll ask him about that in a moment. Uh, very pleased that Jason Rance joins me on the line now. Jason, great to talk to a fellow uh, radio host. Appreciate your time today. Thank you for having me. Uh, give us a little bit of background if you can. I, I've never heard of tag being a violent game. We're not even talking about cops and robbers here. Yeah, it's not a violent game, I, unless something has dramatically changed with the game of tag since I was a kid playing it. It seems like it has not evolved beyond saying you're it, running around and trying to tag the person who uh, you want to then make it. It's a it's a silly little controversy. It's a controversy that started because, frankly, parents and kids were starting to talk about it. Mercer Island is sort of in its own little bubble. It's right near Seattle, so it's about a two-minute drive over the bridge to get to Mercer Island. Not many people really pay attention to what's going on until the parents actually start complaining, and that's actually how this this came out. Yeah, so it's always interesting when, you know, something can be just, you know, two minutes away from a a big city and a wonderful city, yet in its own little world as far as uh, basically making decisions uh, rooted in, well, not rooted in common sense go. So there was a a fair bit of, of backlash by parents, it looks like. Yeah, parents started to get together. They created a Facebook page, which is how I originally heard of this. Certain television stations started to pick it up. And, you know, when asked as to why the school district decided to do it, the communications director, who I think this was her first day on, literally this was the first day of her (laughs) job, was to defend this. She put out a statement that essentially said, look, the, the rationale behind this is to ensure the physical and emotional safety of all students. So the physical aspect of it, I, I guess I can understand because you do have a lot of parents in this country who are quite litigious. If something happens to their uh, child, they are willing to sue the school. So I guess I, I kind of understand where they're coming from on that. The emotional safety, that's where I think a lot of people started to stand up and say, OK, I know that we're going down this very political, politically correct road. This seems a little too much. It's a voluntary game. There's no bullying going on. This is just a simple game of tag. What exactly are we protecting emotionally these students from? No one quite understood it, and that's why this resonated with a lot of people. So, you know, I started to talk about it on the show. I wrote a blog post on it for the show's website. The the Drudge Report picked it up. Got like 100,000 page views in a couple days. And then, lo and behold, the school district decided on Friday night, yeah, we're going to rescind the ban. So tag is back on. And it's uh, a bit interesting here because I was reading your update that you wrote on this, and it said that they blamed false reporting but didn't really share what about any of the reporting had been false. Yeah, they, they haven't indicated what was false. They haven't indicated who was incorrect. I mean, there aside from me, there were a couple of television stations that took this on as well. We've all reported pretty much the same thing. We're simply quoting what they gave us, and we're quoting parents. So I'm not exactly sure. The thing is, this is them trying to save some face, right? I mean, they they feel embarrassed. They should feel embarrassed for this position. And so what do you do when you feel embarrassed? Especially in this town, you generally tend to focus on, like, one person to make the bad guy. (laughs) In this case, it's the media. The media did nothing bad here. This is actually something that the media can do more of and should do more of, which is listen to the parents, listen to communities who are speaking up against just ridiculous issues like this, ridiculous policies like this, and actually be more of an advocate for them. Yeah, this wasn't an issue of, not that I, I by the way, look down upon anyone who does this, but this, this wasn't an issue of you, you know, digging and finding one line in a school policy that you think means something. I mean, you're responding to a controversy that already exists that parents were fueling. I mean, that is the ultimately the best kind of journalism and, and journalistic reporting, I think. Exactly. And look, I don't consider myself a journalist. I consider myself a talk show host. As, as, as with I, so I understand that. <laughs> so, so it's like one of those things where I didn't go looking for this story. The story was put out there by parents, and I chose to jump on this as an advocate for what they were saying because, they, frankly, they're absolutely correct. And we've gone way, way, way too far down this path of protecting kids from absolutely everything. And, you know, people say, and it's a little bit cliche, but I think there's truth in it, you know, we're at that point where you show up and you get an award. You go to a a game and you don't keep track of the score because you don't want people to feel bad. It's it's going too far. And finally, it seems like parents are starting to wake up to the fact that this is probably at the end of the day, way more dangerous for kids than the emotional distress associated with with tag. 
One of the interesting things you pointed out as well is that it's not even consistent with other things that go on at the school. I, I, I found this hilarious. They promote competitive football. Not just football. They have wrestling as well. And I would argue that those, both of those sports are incredibly more violent and dangerous than a game of tag during someone's recess. It, it's ridiculous. And, of course, they make money off of the, you know, the fees associated with those sports. And I'm sure <laughs> Maybe they that's why. That they can't funded. monetize tag. That's why they don't like it. Yeah, it's like, okay, then monetize tag. Just give, <laughs> give a fi- Mercer Island is a very well-to-do neighborhood. These people can afford it. So you want to put a little price tag on a game of tag just so we can get some of our obese children running around <laughs> chasing after each other? I'm, I'm totally okay with that. I, I feel like I like your show. I wish I knew about it when I was in Seattle. But uh, you, you can sort of claim victory for, for common sense on this one. Have you seen other examples in, in the area where not necessarily this is going on, but more of that uh, basically a stymieing of activity and, and this, this bubble wrapping of kids has gone on? Because I've seen it all over, not just in Canada, but in the U.S. as well. I, I'm not sure if it has a regional focus, though, so I'm curious if this is something that, that is indicative of things you've seen elsewhere in, in Washington. Sure. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if it's happening on high school campuses. The truth is I, I, the high school campus beat is not necessarily mine. But <laughs> Fair enough. As far as, you know, we've got a lot of listeners who are in college, and they listen to me. God bless them all. Um, and I, I get the sense that this is very much rampant in college campuses in, in the area, but I would argue it's probably just a, a trend that we're seeing across the country, something that we've been seeing a lot or hearing a lot more of locally has to do with microaggressions. And I don't know if this silly and contrived term has made its way up to Canada. Sadly, the, yes. Yeah. Oh, so for, for people who don't know, essentially microaggressions are any type of comment or presumption that is perceived as a slight, some kind of offense to someone. If you meet someone who was born in Mexico and you assume that they speak Spanish, well, that is a microaggression. It's racist and it's wrong. And so you've got this movement on college campuses locally and across the country that are basically trying to get rid of microaggressions, punish anyone who's committing a microaggression. And remember, the microaggression doesn't even have to be on purpose. It could be totally by accident, just an innocent conversation, an innocent remark. And we're going after speech like that, and that is so incredibly dangerous because you're just creating an environment where people are going to be on, uh, like they're just going to be afraid to speak up or ask questions or do anything. And on the note of microaggressions, I actually had someone point out into an email here something that may be at the root of this. Maybe the problem is that in TAG, one of the principal catchphrases is saying to someone, you're it. It is a microaggression to uh, give someone else a pronoun that they did not choose for themselves. <laughs> no, see, here, the <laughs> argument I made on my show is that if you believe that, you should actually be in favor of TAG because that's a gender nonconforming <laughs> word. <laughs> but, you, but it doesn't allow someone to gender. self-identify by another pronoun. They should ta- they should just change the language around. In fact, <laughs> I, I I'm convinced that that's probably going to happen because we're already seeing. You know, we'll call it Z it Z is it. <laughs> like, how do you do? I don't get it. T- today's satire is tomorrow's talk show topic. I think this is the problem oh, when God. when parody becomes reality, right? Yeah, no kidding. It makes our job a little bit easier. <laughs> Certainly true. Well, anyway, I appreciate that you uh, uh, played a, a large role, it seems, in, in getting the, the war on tag ending. But uh, certainly it's absolutely absurd uh, that this has happened. I'm joined on the line by uh, Jason Rance, talk show host in Seattle, about the uh, Mercer Island School District's war on tag. I uh, really appreciate your time this afternoon, Jason. Thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Make no mistake, this is probably one of the more dramatic and absurd examples of this, but this is hardly, and oh how I wish it were, a new phenomenon. No, in in fact, this happens all over the place. This happens, as I mentioned, in Canada, in the U.S. It's part of this, and I'm so glad he said the word microaggression culture, that turns everything into some sort of a front. It's impossible to just, you know, get hurt or maybe be affronted a little, uh, in a little way. Now it's a federal case when that happens. And one of the shining examples of what more schools need to go towards, I think, is what we're seeing unfold in a couple of areas in New Zealand, of all places. Now, I don't often look to New Zealand and say, yes, that's the way we need to do things. But they they seem to be doing things pretty well, actually, under their prime minister, who basically, along with Stephen Harper, is one of the only conservative leaders in the free world. I digress. A couple of schools in New Zealand have said that they would like to see more play, less rules, 
less zero tolerance policies, less hands free zones, less bans on games, etc. And the results of this, in one case in particular, have been incredible. They've seen less bullying because students are getting their aggression out in different ways. Kids are healthier, which, let's face it, with all that we hear about childhood obesity, why are we in a position to tell kids they shouldn't be running around and having fun? And let's face it, as grown-ups, too, we all recognize, I think, and see the need to blow off a little bit of steam. So why are kids who have arguably more energy in a different category in this respect? So I think all of this is part and parcel of a big wholesale shift that we need to see absolutely need to see and need to see it yesterday, which is to let kids be kids, let teens be teens, let university students be, well, maybe we should make them be someone else. But we need to let people be themselves and not try to turn everything into something that it's not. And if you think that you can extrapolate that comment onto other areas than schoolyard tag, you are darn right that you can. This is a micro example, and in the grand scheme of things, relatively inconsequential because the school decided to recant. They gave in. But there are so many other examples where schoolyard nonsense is not being reversed. It's absolutely not. And this is something we need to advocate for more of, for schools to recognize, hey, we've seen the error of our ways, now let's turn around. And, and look, I mean, this is connected in, in some ways to what we saw last week with Ombed and the clock in Texas. Overreactionism by schools, zero tolerance policies run amok. And all of these that really come under, I think, the same banner, which is a dumbification of the education system, and more importantly, a rejection of some of the time-honored principles that we all grew up with and ended up just fine as a result of. When we come back, more Lawton Online on the Rebel.media. I'm Andrew Lawton. Stay tuned. He's unapologetic, unwavering, and unafraid to take on the left sacred cows. He's Andrew Lawton, and you're listening to Lawton Online on the Rebel.media. So this story I just love. You know, I made a promise a couple of weeks ago on the show that I was only going to talk about politics when I thought there was either a really, really important message to be heard, like at the top of this segment when I was chatting a bit about Bill C-24, or when I was just so thoroughly amused by a story that I had to share. I'm not sure if I included that in my list of caveats for the ban on general election news, but I'm putting it in now because I saw a story this week that I have actually been eager and excited to share. And don't get your hopes up. This is not a huge, earth-shattering, world-altering story. It's not at all. But it certainly is one that I hope will make you chuckle. It actually takes place in Manitoba where, well, no offense, but I don't think anything of significance generally happens. And it's a unique NDP campaign item or campaign initiative that sort of went awry. Now, I want to make very clear that this is why you don't ask the general public for help. This is why you don't crowdsource campaign slogans. This is why there is always a variable, an X factor, if you will, whenever you incorporate the broader voting population. Sometimes they don't give you what you want. Now, while the story takes place in Manitoba, it actually has to do with a candidate for parliament in Calgary representing the NDP. Now, instantly, when you're dealing with a Calgary, Alberta, New Democrat, you're, you're dealing with someone who's probably not been vetted that thoroughly anyway. But the NDP uh, member or uh, aspiring member of parliament had an idea. Now, this is for the riding of Calgary Heritage. Now, this is the first time this riding has ever been in play. It's actually the riding Stephen Harper is running in as a candidate for office. It's taking up most of the former Calgary Southwest, which has been the prime minister's seat uh, as a member of parliament. Now, the campaign item is that voters can spend $50 to send 
Harper a message. For the price of $50, they can write a message that will be put up on a blank white sign with uh, master's name and authorized by the official agent for the NDP, blah, 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 blah. And then when you're driving around, you can read what people are saying to Stephen Harper. The rules have been that anyone can participate. But there's a slight catch. They need to have a message that is tasteful. Well, herein lies the problem then, because one person from Winnipeg decided that he was going to submit a message. But unfortunately, it was tasteful, but still not approved. You see, his message was, and by the way, he thought the idea was, quote, fantastic, being a really fun idea. He gave his 50 bucks, but he decided to write a message of support for Harper. He decided to write a positive message put on a sign paid for by an NDP candidate. Now, he said he got this idea from the fact that his friend said if they put up a pro Harper message, his friend will buy him a drink. So he wrote the message, quote, let's make it four in a row. Go, Harper, go. He got an automated email confirming his donation was received. He also was told a picture of his sign would be provided so we could share it on social media. After hearing nothing for four days, he took to Twitter and said, where's the sign I paid for? Masters himself, Masters Bergener, responded with saying uh, that due to the overwhelming response, there's a backlog. We're working on it. And then after 10 days, he got an email from the team saying they were going to refund his donation. He said, uh, Montgomery said that since they were asking for positive messages, he thought they were going to post it because his was a positive message. He said when a candidate says they're going to do something and doesn't follow through, it's a reflection on the party. He hasn't yet got his refund yet. He said... And I think this is valid. He said, look, if they send me a tax receipt, it'll only end up costing $12.50, which he can deal with. But a spokesperson for the campaign, for the NDP campaign, said that they will actually post any message supporting Harper. Of course, now they've recanted on that, now that someone has actually (laughs) given them the money. Now, look, I don't care about what an NDP campaign does with its signs. The fact is, if you're going to uh, invest in the money that it costs to buy signs, and these aren't cheap, you want signs that are going to go up supporting you. Because the second you put up an NDP sign saying, go Harper, go, then you're obviously going to detract attention from the message you're going to do. But this is why you don't do a campaign like this in the first place. This is why you don't move forward with an initiative like this in the first place, because you're just begging for it to be hijacked. I mean, it's the same as if a candidate doesn't ask me anything on Reddit, which is something that people are are doing in, in large numbers now. I mean, you're just begging to be trolled when you're in there and you can't really do anything about it. Now, apparently the NDP has received 200 requests for signs under this program. Now, now, just do the math on this for a second. 200 requests for signs. That's 10000 bucks right there. So they've made a good chunk of change on this. Apparently, of those, only one had a message supporting Stephen Harper. Only one, they say. Okay, we'll take, take their words for it. I just hope that uh, the refunds do get processed before October 19th, because otherwise, I think it's safe to say we're dealing with a much bigger issue here, but... I also think it's safe to say that Masters Bergener missed campaign messaging seminars or campaign messaging class whenever he was in NDP candidate school, because I'm pretty sure that someone could have uh, nipped this one in the bud before it got to where it's going right now. But hey, if it's bringing in the money, who cares about a minor detour of censorship and not allowing someone to exercise their free speech that they paid for? Now, with that being said, you can always send me your message of support or your message of detraction. And you can also send me 50 bucks if you want, although I won't hold my breath for that. My email address is andrew at andrewlawton.ca. Love to hear from people of all stripes on all occasions for whatever reason. 
And also, uh, please feel free to comment on the rebel.media. What you see, I do read the comments, and, and sometimes I respond. Usually, I'll let people duke it out uh, and, uh, and see what's going on there. And it's not because I, I don't like it. It's because sometimes if, if I comment on something that I, I can't leave and I want to sort of keep responding to people, and then I, I've had online discussions like this on Facebook where it's like eventually it's like, okay, I've got to get to work or got to get to bed. And then people accuse you for, for giving up and walking away and, and saying, oh, you're a wimp, you're scared, so I have to take like a non-engagement rule on comments, but I always uh, always respond to emails when I can. And if I uh, don't respond right away, uh, please know that I did in fact read it. When we come back, it's time for It Must Be a Liberal to wrap up the show. You're listening to Lawton Online here on the Media. Stay tuned, Canada. It's time for It Must Be a Liberal, only on Lawton Online. Scouring every corner of the globe for stories so outrageous, there must be a liberal involved. Yes, indeed. And today for It Must Be a Liberal, we actually have to go just about two hours from me, a city I was in yesterday. Not exactly a bastion of conservatism, so we shouldn't be too surprised that this city made it into It Must Be a Liberal. But the city of Detroit, Michigan... Yes, and it happened this week where it's actually center line Michigan, but it's near Detroit, where a man who had a little bit of a case of an of arachnophobia, but afraid of spiders, caused a fire when he was filling up his car. He was at the gas pumps. He saw a spider near his fuel door and decided instead of squishing it, instead of blowing it on it to get it away, instead of trying to get a napkin, instead of beating it with the squeegee brush, instead of pouring gasoline on it, instead of putting his foot up on the side of the car and squishing it, instead of doing any of those things and probably the myriad other ideas I would, could come up with with more time to kill a spider, he decided to do the responsible adult thing and he got out his cigarette lighter. Now, this happened last Saturday, according to WJBK. He lit the... <laughs> I can't, I'm trying to picture this. Tried to light the spider near the fuel door. Now, as a result of this, he ignited the side of his car and the fire went into the gas pump and blew it up. A clerk then shut off the pump, called the fire department. He can be heard on the surveillance video saying, is that a spider in there? And then the surveillance video shows fumes turning into flames and erupting. <laughs> the man was safe. Apparently he got a fire extinguisher to put out the flames. No spider was seen. He, according to the clerk, apologized the very next day. Isn't that like a Cat Stevens song? No, that's the cat came back the very next day and, and not to apologize for blowing up a gas station. Well, I think it's safe to say when you are so afraid of a spider, you know, Fear of, of small objects being a liberal trait, but especially that you would use a lighter at a gas station to kill it. I think it's safe to say with that level of forethought and knowledge, oh man, you must be a liberal. There's really no other way. I want to give a big thanks to my guest on the show, Jason Rance, as well as, of course, again, to Prime Minister Stephen Harper for the interview and all who tuned in to this edition of Lawton Online. You are listening to Canada's most irreverent podcast here on the Rebel.media. We'll talk to you next week, Canada. Take care, God bless, and good day to you. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to Lawton Online. Check out the rebel.media for lots more fearless content and commentary.